pleasure to give an opportunity to present to you a man that's delighted me for the last three years with incredible creativity and freedom and knowledge. He currently has the wonderful position of at NIMH. The chief said, just make up stuff. Just create. Be damn if he hasn't. Uh, his educational background involved MIT and Boston University. He's implemented MEGs all over the world, Japan, Europe. Uh, he's made me promise not to drool too much in talking <laughs> and singing his praises. But he's got a wonderful mind, and I'm excited to, to present him. As you know, the cutting edge of schizophrenia recently is having to do with uh, uh, working memory. And the task usually is something like NBAC tasks, that sort. And he's taken a very much more fre fresh, collaborative, cooperative kind of view and has emerged with a new technique and some new findings. Actually, scary findings, if they're true. And he's welcoming cooperation. He's willing to share his software. welcomes criticism, which is also amazing. So without much else to talk about, let's hear this man. Thank you. I've wanted to bring him here for the last couple of years. Well, as Arnold uh, pointed out, this is very, very new. And uh, so criticism is really important from you. and. Um, if there's anything you don't uh, follow, because this is not a highly detailed presentation of something very new, then uh, I'll leave time for uh, questions and answers. Anyhow, the, uh, I work in the MEG core facility at the uh, NIMH. And one of the studies we have there is called the sibling study. And it consists of a you know, large number of normal healthy controls, schizophrenics, and their unaffected siblings. And they're brought in for a multi-battery uh, test, including functional MRI, um, genetic studies, um, psychometric studies, and magnetoencephalography. So um, the uh, work that has been done by the MedCore facility mainly focused on working memory test, which is one of the, the more obvious deficits that uh, schizophrenics have. And they've done a lot to characterize this. And it turns out that the working memory test shows the deficit in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex bilaterally and um, superior parietal cortex. And these are all associated with the working memory test. When you compare schizophrenics with healthy controls, you find that the schizophrenics response in those areas is blunted. So um, working memory is only part of the constellation of uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. And one might ask, are there any markers for the language dysfunction and even psychosis? So I will walk you through how we uh, arrived at this analysis. Um, so please bear with me for the preliminaries. Uh, this briefly is what the, uh, what the fMRI findings from the sibling study look like. So you have the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and parietal, superior parietal. This is the healthy control. These are the schizophrenics. And there's a decreased response in those areas. 
But is that really getting at the heart of psychosis? This is, could be other, other disorders that produce these deficits. So um, preliminaries make any EEG signals are non-stationary, non-linear, and they're noisy. And by non-stationary, we mean that the uh, signals change with time. So for example, um, you may be used to looking at an evoked response study where you average uh, many, many trials to uh, the same stimulus, perhaps a you know, one kilohertz tone burst. And people assume that the response is stationary throughout all the trials. But actually, if you examine individual trials, you find that the first few trials, the responses are large. And then subsequent trials, they get subsequently smaller and may even disappear and come back after many trials. So you look at an average and you say, well, this is the stationary property, but in fact, the brain is always changing. And as they say, you can't put your foot in the same river twice. So MIG signals and EEG signals are chaotic, quasi-stationary. They are said to be stationary for about a quarter of a second. And in this study, I've picked high gamma band, 70 to 185 hertz, for the analysis because I want to avoid the uh, rhythmic activity associated with the lower frequencies like alpha rhythm and beta. Um, transfer entropy is a measure of directional information flow between two random processes and as implied for the uh, brain analysis. Transfer entropy um, would be a measure of directional flow between brain regions. So if I can localize brain regions and localize the signals from them, I can determine the to and from information flow. So with uh, Arnold earlier on, I started to embark on a study to use something called tempodynamic transfer entropy. And the idea of this concept was to be able to look at the event-related changes in information flow between regions. And um, this is done using a so-called leaky integrator. That is, you, in order to determine information transfer, you need to do the probability of states. So if we allow the brain states that we measure to decay out in time using this integration technique, we can follow the changes in brain activity and in information transfer. And longer decay rates, low pass filter your signal, shorter ones are uh, necessary for um, looking at the actual transfer in time. So I'll give you some examples. This is from um, electrocorticogram data. And here you see a 100 millisecond decay rate. And then a one second decay rate, two seconds, and five seconds. And as you can see, the response, and this was someone wiggling their finger. So this response occurs just before zero milliseconds. But the thing that struck me when looking at this, which leads into the methodology that I'll use, is if you look at the scales, as the decay rates get longer, the information transfer, the average or mean information transfer decreases. 
So there's something characteristic about the, uh, the decay rate that ends up producing more information transfer with shorter decays. And this has to do with predictability that is well known in signal processing that for short time periods, you can predict even random sequences. Band-limited random sequences are predictable. So I have come up with something called average decay rate of information transfer. Give it the acronym ADVATE. And um, I can compute the probability density functions and the information transfer as a function of decay rate. In fact, I choose something like 40 log spaced decay rates going from 50 milliseconds to 1500 milliseconds to explore where, where the maximum is. Now it turns out that if you do this, what you find is that the information transfer just increases monotonically as the decays get shorter. However, if I have a random data called a surrogate random data, and I can create this mathematically, it too behaves the same way, that is, shorter decays produce more information, mean information. So here, the blue trace is the information transfer between two regions from MEG. And as you see on the scale which extends from tens of seconds out to um, 20 milliseconds, the decay rate just increases monotonically. The red trace is the random surrogate. So if you take the difference, you have, this is magnified, of course. Take the difference, and you get this kind of a trace, which has a peak at some time. Now that peak is indicative of the optimal decay rate for maximizing information transfer. And I call it the average decay rate of information transfer, or a droid. So the analytic methods that I used were to, for um, this data, which consisted of seven healthy normal controls and six schizophrenics. These were extracted from the sibling study, just randomly selected. So I chose 26 regions of interest, mainly in the prefrontal cortex, frontal lobes, and temporal lobes on both, both hemispheres. So 26, there are 650 unique combinations for directional information flow between these 26 regions. So I computed the source time series, which is the measurement of the, um, it's, it's a statistical estimate of the actual signal from each region of the brain. And I used an extended source beamformer. Um, beamformer methods are in the literature for MEG research. Computed the excess transfer entropy at 40 decay rate intervals and used interpolation using a spline fit and then selected the decay rates that the uh, information transfer was maximum at uh, for statistical testing. 
So here's an example of from MEG of the these blocks, the blue squares, represent the uh, the measured, the estimated decays that were computed. So there are 40 squares. They're spaced out logarithmically. And this, so this is between two regions which are selected. And you see that depending on the depending on the regions you get different decay rates. So these are the peak decay. This is the point of peak decay rate, which is predicted from the data and the spline fit. So is that pretty clear what I mean by a droid, the average decay rate of information transfer? Because the idea is that this is averaged out across an entire 240 second period of time to find, even though the brain is non-stationary, you're really finding the optimal decay rate of stationarity. So here's all the data, plotted decay rate from 50 milliseconds to one and a half seconds. There's the excess transfer entropy. The normal subjects are blue dots. Schizophrenics are red. Unfortunately, this GNU plot um, overlays the dots on top of another, so you really can't see, but they are, they look like they're distributed pretty much randomly. So you can't discriminate based on this kind of an analysis. So now let's look at the mean difference. So if I take the mean for each region of interest pair of the schizophrenics minus the normals, so taking those means, I can look at the directional changes. And again, there doesn't seem to be any preferential dif difference when you look at the data this way between the schizophrenics and the uh, normals. However, we can do statistical testing, and I just chose a uh, two-tailed t-test to look at the probability that the schizophrenics are the same as the normals on a regional pair by regional pair basis. So we're sorting through 650 potential pairs and looking at the statistics. And there, this is the raw statistics without correction. And you see here's 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1. So it appears that these points are outliers of sorts that may be of significance. So I then applied false discovery rate FDR correction because we're making multiple comparisons, six, 650 comparisons uh, to determine you know, what the corrected probabilities are. And I'll show you what the P less than 0.05 plots look like. But it's interesting that there we see only differences where the decay rate of the schizophrenics is longer than that of the controls. There are no outliers showing any significance for the opposite. So here's the scatter plot. So you have a few points here just below 60 milliseconds decay rate and a few of them out over 100. And here's where they are. Can you read that clearly? So you will note that what shows up everywhere is the right pars triangularis, which is 
counterpart of the left, which is in part Broca's area. So look, here transfer from that to left free central. There's the decay rate and the corrected p values. Transfer from left pre central to right pars triangularis, left frontal middle sulcus to pars triangularis. These two have shorter decay rates. But again, pars triangularis on the right side to left middle frontal sulcus. So it seems that we have involvement of the right hemisphere in what would be the right counterpart of the language region. And that's associated with this longer, longer decay rate. So it rate is, the rate numbers are uh, larger. Now we can do this same thing to see whether the amount of information transferred at the peak is statistically different. So again, we find that the information transfer doesn't seem to have a directional preference, unlike the adroit measure. But there's the scatter plot we have five significant, um, after correction, five significant uh, points. And despite the fact that there's no consistency in direction of which is larger and which is smaller, look what shows up. Pars triangularis on the right side, again. So there seems to be some involvement in this right hemisphere counterpart of language areas. What does it mean? Well, searching the literature, since I'm really used to uh, MEG and EEG literature, I came upon some papers that were kind of interesting. One of them by uh, Suga in Japan suggested that there's morphometric differences between the right and left pars triangularis. Morphometric meaning that there is less gray matter. He did a study with, I think, 40 or 50 normal subjects and schizophrenics were first episode schizophrenics and also ultra high risk patients that were uh, bordering on schizophrenia. So he said the right PT pars triangularis may preferentially contribute to the pathogenesis of psychotic symptoms, not language but psychotic symptoms. So if you follow up on this paper, you'll see that they did ANOVA against other parameters, other factors. And it looked very much like the measure of loss of gray matter follows the severity of psychosis. Another paper, decreased language lateralization is character characteristic of psychosis for uh, or not auditory hallucinations. Here's from the SUBA paper. So here's the left hemisphere and the right in BA45, which is counterpart of right uh, pars triangularis has the largest deficit of uh, loss of gray matter. So these are not my findings. These are the morphometric findings. 
as you can imagine, with this measure, the adroit measure, there is no counterparts I can find in the literature. And in fact, the literature, even though there is information on functional imaging of language, it makes very little mention of the role of language lateralization or lack of it for lateralization in schizophrenia. So there's a lot to follow up on. And uh, with that, this is a short talk, and I'm ready for questions. My uh, colleague, of course, is Dr. Mandel. Um, uh, Richard Coppola, who's at, uh, he just retired as director of the MedCore facility at NIMH. And Bonnie Jean Levinson Hudson, who did the uh, research searching for the literature references that may relate to this. So, any questions? <laughs> yes. So, um, I'm, I'm, I just had a, uh, a question about the protocol, and that is, is the section of EEG that you're, or MEG that you're using, you said it's 250 milliseconds long? No. The data was uh, task-free resting MEG. Okay, so it's task-free And it's a 240-second data set. Oh, OK. And so? So this is, the, the average decay rate is across the entire data set. And the way it's determined is by applying successively trying to estimate transfer entropy with different decay rates. So I have 40 different decay rates. This is computationally intensive. So each time I have to go through using a different decay rate to determine the transfer entropy of the data between two regions and of a random surrogate between the same two regions. So um, the fact is, if you look back, let me go backward. There. So this is the excess transfer entropy between two pairs of regions. And you can see that the decay rates are really quite different depending on the region you look at. Now, that doesn't mean that they distinguish between um, schizophrenics and uh, healthy controls using just the decay rate. Right. So this is a regional, this is a regional pair property that they have different characteristic decay so rates. So can you say anything about the different regions that, res that have the different de decay rates? That, you know, the no, I have not looked at that. OK, so you don't know if it's more frontal versus posterior or? That's a very good question. As I said, this is very new. And I've prepared this material in a hurry. And there's a lot to do. One of the things that has been offered, which I will follow up on is uh, at the NIMH, they're going to provide me with a vetted set of uh, data sets, probably something like 40 normals and 40 healthy controls. And uh, these are matched for age, gender, and uh, they will also have the associated diagnostic criteria. So you'll have age of onset of symptoms, severity of symptoms, medication, other psychometric factors. So one of, one of the questions, I, I don't want to hog this, so anybody who wants to ask we have plenty of time. jump in. But um, I'd be, I really like the, uh, the sibling pair data set. I think it's really a great data set, and there have been a lot of papers like Danny Weinberg's published some yes. work on that, looking, you know, looking at hippocampal um, morphometry. One of the things I'm wondering is, how, 
can you or have you thought about comparing the schizophrenic with the unaffected sibling? I mean, because that's that's like a. I have that data. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just. I just think it would be fascinating to see it. So obviously you're onto something. So this is just the next step kind of thing to kind of look. I at. think it would be very interesting since there's morphometric data on the siblings. In fact, that that data exists for these patients, but I, I things are compartmentalized at the uh, NIMH and everything's on a need to know, and this is obviously to uh, you know, keep patient confidentiality for uh, personal information. So I have the data, but I have to ask for all the associated uh, parameters like age and gender. So I apologize for not having that. Sibling data is on my computer, and um, that too is going to be analyzed. Um, Danny Weinberger also, I'm told, has postmortem uh, uh, morphometric data on schizophrenics. And I'm hoping that I can uh, find out which layers of the cortex are involved in the, uh, dec if any, are involved in the decreased um, volume, decreased cortical volume for those regions, uh, because that may give additional clues to the neuroscience that is maybe we can determine from which layers are lost why the decay rates are prolonged. So these decay rates, again, you can think of it as a measure of um, stationarity. So what it's suggesting is that the schizophrenics have to generate their communications longer in order to get the messages through, and perhaps bi-directionally, they may require repeat trials to you know, get communication between two regions. And it looks very much like the pars triangularis on the right side, and for this measure, for this measure, is of interest. And if this turns out to be correct, I want to follow up. And when I do uh, analysis of covariance, it's going to be against things like the severity of the uh, symptoms, the initial symptoms. And I also have the opportunity to get um, access in Germany, a colleague of mine, Sergio Sokodar, who's a psychiatrist at University of Tübingen, has MEG and, and access to uh, the, the drug naive patients that are brought to the university hospital. So we can look at first episode, first episode patients. I think that would be of interest as well. But you're right, the siblings probably do have some of the morphometric deficits. They share, they share a lot of genes. Maybe this is a naive question, because I'm- I know, I know you don't. Okay, and that is um, that um, if you do this sort of thing as you have, and you see this time dependence, would it be true, because of this decay rate, that the area under the curve of any spike is going to dictate how fast that trans or how much that transfers over distance? You mean from from a single neuron spike? Yeah. That spike. If, if you have something that decays at the one over the natural log of the e, and you say that entropy is a temperature independent term because body temperature is constant. And then you, you look at the area under every one of those curves, the greater the area, the greater the probability is that it's going to cause interference with something else. That, it's an interesting and that's how it, um, a chemist might look at it, or a thermodynamicist, and maybe not a psychiatrist. And <laughs> so. Well, um, you note that I chose high, beta band, high gamma band rather of 70 to 185 hertz. 
And my thought is that this is the region where the brain signal is asynchronous. So you're really looking at the, the, the chaos associated with discharge of neurons. So the way they summate, we can't look at the individual neurons. We don't have the spatial resolution of single microelectrodes. Yeah. But the, uh, the, uh, what looks like noise to people in this region is really chaos. And um, it's kind of interesting to look at that rather than rhythms, because rhythms convey very little information. Yeah. You know, if you have a narrow band signal like 10 hertz plus or minus one or two hertz, there's um, a, a uh, theorem called the uh, Shannon Hartley theorem that tells how much data how much information can go through this narrow band. And it's not very much. No, but if you take the area under those, I know what you say. transfer over a longer distance. There, there's you also. I understand the point about the chaos, because that's what's happening in the federal government right now, and it's interfering with everything else. But you know that. Um, but you could see Good analogy. transferring from one regional area to another. Well, the other way of looking at the prolonged decay rates is that this tail shows that there's no sharp peak in the average, uh, average transfer of information. That is, that is, there are a variety of quasi-stationary states that arise between you know, communication with these pairs. And it may have to do with the fact that there's no such thing as resting state. It's task-free. And person's mind can wander. And depending on whatever thoughts are fixated on from moment to moment, you might get a variety of decay rates that don't differ by very much. So that's how I prefer to interpret this, is that you know, if you look at sharp peaks, whoops, sharper peaks, there seems to be an optimal decay rate that changes very rapidly. But the longer ones seem right. to extend so out quite a bit. Time. And if you look at this plot, you'll notice that there's a bunch of points that are bunched up at 1,500 milliseconds. And that's because the analysis that I set up didn't uh, go beyond that. Um, but apparently, there are some pairs in some data sets that have extremely long decay rates. And I have to investigate all of this. So th this is intriguing. This is a new way of looking at the activity between re regions of the brain, a new way of characterizing it that is not seen with linear methods, with functional MRI. And it points to different regions of the brain that are, uh, you know, usually not characterized by the functional imaging methods of being relevant to schizophrenia. And yet, it apparently is because of the statistical testing. As I said, once I do the large bedded data sets and have uh, analysis of covariance against all cofactors, we will see whether this relates to just language dysfunction or to psychosis. But the suggestion from this Japanese group, uh, Suga et al., suggests that it relates to psychosis. And specifically, the right part is triangularis. This may have application in other areas, too. If you think about it, Things like traumatic brain injury 
you know, from re repeated injuries such as in sports or maybe repeated in injuries in battlefield may show up as deficits in ability to carry, convey information between two points. There's an interesting, there's an interesting paper in the literature which I, I was not aware of since my specialty is not neuroanatomy. Uh, Has anyone heard of Yakov Levy and Torque? Well, it turns out Yakov Lev was a uh, Harvard neuroanatomist. He was born in the late 1800s. And he described the normal brain as having the left hemisphere slightly ahead of the right when you look at the anatomy closely. So it's as if the brain was twisted, viewing from the top counterclockwise. And it turns out that when you look at the schizophrenic brain, this rotation is not as prominent. In fact, it may be absent. So there are developmental neuroanatomical changes that uh, all relate to this. And it's going to take a lot of work and uh, more colleagues for anyone who is interested in participating in this. My view would be good. <clears throat> Very interesting uh, approach. Um, I know it's computation, I gather that it's computationally intensive. Absolutely. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, you're characterizing individuals, um, and I'm curious as to how stable the characterization is across time. So if you had MEG from another day from the same individuals, um, how? I do have some of the patients, which I haven't identified yet. Um, the MEG sibling study does call for repeats, repeat measurements, sometimes spaced several days, sometimes over a year. And uh, so I have not looked at that data. But yes, that would be also of interest to see whether these characteristics are, uh, you know, replicable and stable. But I suspect from the literature that since the major changes are with first episode schizophrenics, morph morphologically, that this will hold throughout, although there is probably, you know, some um, cognitive uh, losses that are progressive. I don't know how they relate to the adroit measure, but we can find out. But this is this requires having you know one person, and I have Arnold to help me through this, and I'm trying to make sense out of these uh, numbers. I was thinking of your. Um... PTSD and TBI kinds of um, application where you may there may be longitudinal MEG data. I'm not certain of that, but um, because the implication I think would be one would like to see a change in right. in the adroit measure. Yes. Before and after an insult. Well, also we have as part of the sibling study some subset of patients undergo um, brief withdrawal from their uh, chlorpromazine equivalents. So there's also that cofactor is we have to make absolutely sure that this measure is not simply a, a relationship that has to do with the medication. Vis-a-vis -vis the tr trauma business is mysterious in that they have populations in which the syndrome gets worse and worse, even without continued perturbation. It's almost as though the scarring starts. And scarring leads to more scarring, leads to more scarring, or whatever it is. So, well, browsing through the literature, I also 
see that uh, uh, in major depressive disorder, that uh, loss of gray matter in the occipital lobes, of all things, is, is uh, a feature. So this too, we, we do have a study on uh, MDD in, uh, at the NIMH, and I in fact have some uh, MEG data on them. Uh, there's this ongoing study called the ketamine study, uh, where they, uh, they look at the effects of before and after a, a bolus of ketamine on MDD to see what the changes in uh, ME, MEG and symptoms are. So I would be really interested in tapping into that. In order to do so, I have to take uh, some internal courses to uh, qualify for being a co-investigator with each of these groups. The politics. And I'm trying to look for postdocs. Yeah, I would really greatly appreciate not just comments, but um, interference, even if you don't have MEG and uh, aren't able to, to uh, participate directly to provide guidance. My, uh, my work here is currently mainly in signal processing of MEG. My background is in neuroscience, but it's a very broad field and familiarizing myself with the literature for schizophrenia is a major undertaking. I, I want to mention that uh, since that we're looking for postdoc or pre-postdoc is that I Why have- Why don't you get up and make the pitch? No, I, the, 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 the Fetzer Foundation is willing to support uh, postdocs at NIH to do this work. So one of the hidden agendas of bringing him here besides the delight is to recruit some people that, that might be interested in working either here or at NIH to, to do this and wouldn't have to go get their own grant to do that. Already. In fact, he's the one that, that, that was the one that brought him out here. Okay. Thank you guys for showing up. Anyone else? I was afraid that it was so esoteric. That <laughs> it is esoteric. I tried to explain how we, how we arrived at this measure. And uh, it was a big surprise to see that you know, the literature says, oh, stationary for a quarter of a second. But in fact, there's this wide range. There's this wide range of decay rates that indicate that stationarity varies over a very wide range. Of course, the studies of stationarity are generally done with whole head, ME, whole head EEG and don't focus on regions of interest. They're really looking at the stability of topological patterns of electrical potentials. Well, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. It was a very exciting talk, and we really appreciate that you've been presenting the data. Um, they, unfortunately, it opens up more questions than you can answer <laughs> at the moment, but right. that's the sign of a really exciting research project. So. Well, opening up more questions is why I'm currently drowning in things to do. Right. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.